Uh, start with a little story and then tie it into the statement of Pekeva that you could take with you uh, for the week. So um, there was this guy that's traveling far away a long time ago and he's uh, traveling on a boat going in a great distance. Doesn't know where he's going exactly but he's traveling for many, many months on this ship, let's say. And eventually he gets to his uh, destination and as he's getting there, he sees thousands of people at the port. There's noise. It looks like a protest. There's something going on, a parade. There's music. There's balloons, if there was something then like that back then. And there was just uh, a lot of noise. And as he gets off the boat, they start screaming, King, oh King, welcome. And all of a sudden, people start bowing down in front of him, they lie down on the floor in front of him and they say, welcome our king. And all of a sudden there's a whole group of people, you watched this, right, a few months ago in England. All of a sudden there's a whole group of people that come, they're carrying a crown and a special cloak and they put the crown on him and they give him the cloak and they say, you are our king. And he's like, okay, <laughs> I'll take that. And... Uh, they take him in a beautiful chariot and they take him to the palace and he's, he can't believe his luck. He's like, this is amazing. There you go. Uh, this is brilliant. It's perfect. And he gets taken in. They treat him well. They show him around his palace. His servants are there waiting to serve him food after this long journey. And he's like, wow, this is unbelievable. And he says, okay, I'll take it. And for the next few days, he's thinking to himself, I don't know what's going on here. He wakes up every day. They're serving him. The whole country, the whole country have pictures of him everywhere. He is the king, and it's real. And he's like, okay, is this me? Is this happening? I... At some point, he says, something's odd. Like, why me? So he goes to some of the servants at his palace, and he says to them, can I ask you a question? Why was I picked as the king? Why did you pick me? So they said, listen, you can ask any question you want, but that question you can't ask. You have to enjoy this place. You are the king, but you can't ask questions about how you became the king. And this went on for another few weeks until he said to himself, okay, I'm done. This is just, this is blowing my mind. I'm just... I am the king, but why me? So he decides to pick on one servant that's in his palace. That's kind of, you know, making the coffees on the side, not really got a proper job. And he goes to him and uh, he says to him, please, I want to know, what's going on here? Why, why, what, why did they choose me and why me? I'm, I'm coming from far away. He says, king, I don't know, I can't answer you that question. So the king decides he's gonna pick up this guy and make him his best friend, treat him well for weeks on end until eventually he tells him what is up, what's going on. So he starts treating him, feeds him, he gives him uh, gifts and starts ranking him, putting, up, putting him up as like his second in command. He really treats him well. And after a few months, this guy is loving his life. He's been treated very well by the king. And he calls him in and he says, okay, look what I've done for you. Please tell me the secret. Why did they choose me? So he says, listen, that's a, a oath that I promised. I can't, I made a promise. I can never tell you the reason why you became the king. That's a promise within our country. We're not allowed to reveal it to you. He says, but look what I've done for you. Look how I've cared for you, looked after you. Please tell me what's the reason. He says, okay, I may be killed for this, but I'll tell you. He said that the kingdom at some point was sick and tired of tyranny, of kings taking over. So what they said, they, they had a, a meeting, a discussion, and they said that from now on, Every year, we're going to pick on a new king. We're going to go to the shore, 
and we're going to find the first person that looks somewhat normal, that comes off the boat, we're going to make him the king. We're sick and tired of these kings ruling our lives and then taking over. This is the way we're going to do it. So he says to him, well, what happens after the year? Oh, I can't tell you. What do you mean? What happens after the year? Please. And he opens up and he tells him, oh, after the year's over, they come up to you. Everyone that's in the palace, they tie you up. And they tell you that your job is over. You got the gift as a king for one year. And now it's over. What do they do with me? They take you to another island far away. And they leave you there. What's there? Nothing. There's nothing there. It's just an empty island. And they leave you there. So the king immediately says, okay, I have some time. It's only been two months. I have another whole ten months in my hands. I know exactly what I need to do. And as soon as he secretly he gets together some some people that are close to him. He builds a relationship with some other people, including this guy. And he starts sending them to this island. And he sends many people to go there. And whilst he sends them there, he's also sending a lot of, he's making money as a king. He's dealing with a lot of money in the country. And he's sending plenty of money there. And he tells them, you go there, you build a beautiful house, build schools, build a beautiful kingdom. This is not Purple Jacket story. Build a beautiful, beautiful kingdom. Build a beautiful house. Build, redo that place. Make it gorgeous. And he sends more and more people, more money there. Riches are going to this random island. And it's becoming this most gorgeous place. And guess what? Eventually the year's up. And they turn on him. Suddenly the palace gets closed. Everything goes dark. And all of the... People that work in the palace go up to the king with chains. He says, he was a little Israeli. <laughs> don't, don't tie me up. It's fine. I know exactly what you want to do. No problem. You don't need to tie me up. I'm not. They were used to it every year. When they tell the king that they're about to send him out, he's like, what do you mean? I'm the king. He believes in it. And he says, this is my life. What are you talking about? And he, he starts fighting, so they have to really tie him up and throw him. But this time, surprise, surprise, the king is relaxed. And he's not only relaxed, he says, you don't tie me up. I know exactly what I, I, know, I know. I get it. And he goes with them. They follow him like a king. He goes with them. And he goes on to the boat that was designated for him to be thrown away. He sits on it like a king and gets taken away to this island. And as soon as he arrives at the island, what does he see? All his friends, all his riches, everything that he's been uh, counting and working on has eventually been sent there. And he's, it's just waiting for him. And he's now the new king in his new kingdom. My friends, that is the message of our lives. We say in Eshet Chayil, every Shabbat, there's a song that we sing. And we say in that song that She laughs on the last day. On the last day, she starts laughing. Who is that talking about? It literally is talking about the wife. On the end of her life, the wife laughs at what she's achieved. A woman of valor, a woman of greatness looks at the end of her life and says, that's why we sing Eshet Chaya on Shabbat. Literally, he's talking about a relationship. But it's also talking about the soul. The soul in Hebrew is the neshama, it's, it's female. And it represents the Eshet Chaya. There's reasons for that. There's a reason for every single thing in spirituality why it's either designated as a female or male. It's not, not physical, but it has that element to it. So the soul in us has a, is a female. And it says that the soul, if it does what it's meant to do in this relationship with the world, it laughs on the last day. And eventually it looks back and it smiles. And what does it mean? It means that the righteous people in this world that live to their potential, they take the energy that they have or that's been given to them. No one's perfect. But whatever potential they have, they take it and they build on it. And they build themselves with it. 
they look back at their life, they don't want to die. A righteous person doesn't want to die also. He knows that I've done amazing things in this world, but it's only in this world that I can achieve. It says, The dead are free. What are they free from? Responsibility. They don't have mitzvot. They don't have any requirements to be good, to do kindness, to be responsible. There's no more responsibility for someone that's dead. So when we die, we're free. If anyone wants to be free, right? Death is freedom, according to Judaism, where you're not, you're not challenged in this world. But you won't be free if you take your life away, right? In Judaism, the worst thing that somebody could do is take themselves, take their life away. It's the greatest regret that the soul can, can have. You can never run away from reality. But whilst we're in this world, you have an opportunity to achieve more. So a righteous person, towards the end of his life, says, I don't want to leave because I can do another mitzvah. I can do another good deed. There's another little bit of good that I can do. Once I leave this world, I can't do that anymore. They say that the Gaon of Vilna, the great Gaon of Vilna from Lithuania, before he passed away, he started crying. They said, Rabbi, why are you crying? You've been great your whole life. You've achieved so much. And he said that the, small, the mitzvah that I can do right now, I can't do when I leave this world. He's looking at his tzitzit, and he said, I can't. Once you leave this world, you don't even have that. I can't do mitzvot anymore. So I can't fill my potential because my potential ends. Literally, you know, like you look at the, the heartbeat or what's the machine called when they attach it to you? To your, what's it called? Pacemaker. A pacemaker. So you see, and when someone's alive, what, what is it? It's like this, right? What's it? Not the pacemaker. What's it called? I, I'm sorry, what's it called? EKG. EKG machine, right. So the EKG is literally going like this. Why? Because that's how life is. Right? We go like this, but when someone's dead, it's flat. There's no tone, there's no change. Everything's just simple. When you have change in life, when things are challenging, that means that you're alive. But that also means that you have potential to achieve. But the minute that it stops, that's it. There's no more ability to achieve. So the righteous people might be sad to leave this world, but they also leave. They laugh on their last day. They say, I'm ready. I've achieved so much, now I'm ready to receive and understand and see what I've really done. It says that in this world, we don't see the actions we do. I give somebody life. How do I give them life? I smile to them. They were thinking, like I was just talking about, they were thinking that they'll be more free by escaping life. I smiled to them. I said, dude, you look awesome today. And they were thinking that day, specifically that day, to take themselves away. That's it, done. I'm done with life. But your words, dude, you look awesome today, or whatever it is, made them feel like I can live a little more. Yeah, but there's a ripple effect to those words. You didn't just say, hey, you're awesome today. You also gave that person children. Every mitzvah that that person now does for the entire lifetime is on you. Can you imagine the if ripple effect of a small action? We don't. We don't know the ripple effect of good. That's why it says that It says in the Talmud that even the most empty person, a Jew that feels like I've done nothing in my life, is filled with a mitzvot like a rimon, like a pomegranate. A pomegranate, you look at it, it has way too many seeds in there. And each one builds you another tree. Right? If you plant them, that's, that's, a, that's a human being. You are filled with potential like actions that are all fruits and trees that you don't even know what your action has done. You don't see the effects of your good. But when a person leaves this world, if you've done a lot of good in your lifetime, so you leave this world, you know. I'm free from responsibility, but now I'm a king. That's how Judaism looks at life. Who said this? Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva said, actually, there's another story with the Chafetz Chaim, just to quickly, and then I'll tie it into to what we say in Pekei Avot, and then we'll finish. But there's another story with the Chafetz Chaim. I've said this many times. The Chafetz Chaim was a great Ashkenazic rabbi. He lived in Radin in Belarus, which is in Belarus today. And uh, he was a very righteous man. He wrote many, many books and transformed the Jewry of today. He was Rav uh, Kagan, Rav Meir Kagan. He was a Kohen. 
And he was a very, very great rabbi for the Jewish people. Anyone who studies Torah today knows the impact that he has on, on the study that you do. So uh, he lived in a very small little shtetl with a tiny, small apartment and hundreds of people would wait outside in the freezing cold to see him. All day, people were waiting just to get a blessing from him. He was very righteous. He died in 1933. Uh, He actually predicted that the Holocaust was going to happen. There's many things that he said that he knew and he warned and he said, this is, we're we're really in the dangerous time. Everything, it it was beyond, across the board of Judaism, everyone recognizes this great man. So he lived in a tiny little, tiny little room with some wooden bed, not much there. And he would study Torah there all day and write his books. And that's how he lived. Till, and he lived for very long. I think he was over 100 years old when he passed away. He lived for very, very long in tremendous poverty and wouldn't take a penny even when he became famous as for what he achieved and for what he wrote. He wouldn't take a penny. So. Uh, he had people come to him, and sometimes he had very wealthy people come to him. Everyone came to him to get a blessing. There was this one wealthy man that came, knocks on, goes to get a blessing, but is astonished by the way he's living. This is, this is insane. Like how, how is he living in such poor conditions? I mean, he's not got a couch. He's not got a sofa. No, no, just a straw bed, like whatever it is, and so simple. So he comes to the rabbi and says to him, Rabbi, where is your sofa? Where's all your stuff? So the, I mean, you have so many people coming to you, you should have a bigger place. So the rabbi looks at him and says to him, where's your sofa? He says, what do you mean, where's my sofa? <coughs> my sofa's at home, and I am traveling. The rabbi says, your sofa's at home, and it's not with you because you're traveling. The rabbi says, me too. I'm traveling also. When you travel, you don't take everything with you. He had the right perspective of life, that really we're all traveling through life. Some people, there was a guy that was just in, uh, I study in a, in a synagogue here all day, and I meet people as well. Most of my days there studying. And um, there was a guy that comes, an older man that comes there every single day in the morning, just this week. Suddenly, from one day to the next, he was there the day before, the next day he didn't wake up, they told us he passed away. I was like, what? He was here yesterday. That's really, I know it's heavy, but that's the reality. And when somebody looks at life in a way where you see yourself as a visitor of this world, you actually enjoy this world more. That sounds crazy, right? It sounds the opposite, but it's the truth. And I'll prove it to you. If you're on a vacation for a year, you say to yourself, I'm going on vacation for one whole year. You're in, I don't know, Orlando. That's a nice place. And you decide to be there for one year. So you say to yourself, okay, Disney, I'll go visit there sometime. Whatever, I have a whole year. Don't need to go there every day. I don't need to make the most out of it. What else is in Orlando? Not, nothing. That's it. There's some other stuff. Whatever. Crocodiles. crocodiles. I'll go see the crocodiles. I'll see them tomorrow. What's the, what's the fuss? Or Miami. Or I'll go somewhere else. I'm there for a year. There's no pressure. Take your time. Enjoy the trip. Right? But what happens whilst he's there? A friend says, hey, I'm coming to visit for two weeks. Oh, the friend comes to visit for two weeks. In those two weeks, he'll do what you do in an entire year. He'll make the most of those two weeks. I'm not going to waste my time. I have two weeks here. Everything that you do in one year, I'll do in two weeks. Is that my car? <laughs> it's fine. It sounds like ours. Oh, it's over there. It just echoed Across the road? Okay. I'll just speak into the mic a little more. Ron, can you hear it? Sure. Just no part. You hear it now? Yeah. So, a person that says to himself, this world that I'm in is. Forever. Subconsciously, we all know it's not. But we, we trick ourselves subconsciously to think that we're here forever. What does, what does that person say? I have time. Today's another day. Who cares? 
So tomorrow there'll be another day, and tomorrow will be another day. And it comes this monotonous tune of going through each day and saying, oh, tomorrow's another day. Wait a second. You're a visitor in this world. You're not here forever. Make the most. You're here for a very small amount of time, theoretically. I mean, in reality. I know that 80 years is long, but really, it's quick. Or 90 years. It's a very short amount of time. But subconsciously, we say we're immortal because truthfully, deep down, we are immortal. We have a soul that never dies. So deep down, we exist, but we, our bodies don't. And we know that. But we trick ourselves to say we're here forever. And what do we do? Today's another day. Let's waste it again. Let's waste tomorrow again. But we, when you look at life, that you're only here for two weeks, but you've got to visit everything before you leave, you're what you're traveling, then you actually enjoy the world a little more because you make the most out of this world. A traveler makes the most out of this world. Do you know what else a traveler does? He doesn't waste this world physically. I'll tell you a great story. This happened to us. So I have these headphones. You know, you, know, you get these headphones and they just, they, you pay so much for them, but then they, hey, these are not the AirPods. We have AirPods also. Shira's got AirPods, but I got this one. So, so <laughs> she's, she's cooler than me. You got me the AirPods. Yeah. And she's like, why did you buy this? Okay. I'm like, you need it. Trust me. So anyway, I, I find that this changed my life. It's like amazing. But there's a catch. Sometimes they fall out. You lose one. You're like, oh, forget it. And you get rid of it. Has anyone ha ever had that? Fell out? You lost it? You're looking for it? No? Yeah. It's like, oh. So I was in the park with Abraham on a Sunday. I took him to the park and I was biking and I had it in my pocket. And it fell out at some point. The next day, I'm, I'm, looking my, I'm taking out my headphones. I see there's only one. Oh, no. It fell on the floor. One of them came out. And I'm thinking, I remember where it fell just by where I parked the car. So the next day, that next day, it was our anniversary, and we were planning to go out. This is uh, two weeks ago. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it was, it was. Uh, thank you. Thirteen. Thirteen. With bar mitzvah and marriage. I don't know if it, I don't know if that means anything. Okay. It means a lot. No, no, no. I'm ter in terms of bar mitzvah, like, do you have to celebrate extra? Yeah. Oh, trust me, it means a lot. Okay. It goes without saying. Okay, so, um, so, so I, we decided, okay, I asked you, listen, we're go I know we're going on a, it's, it's our anniversary, we're going somewhere nice, but just on the way, can we go to the park a second? And I was saying this because I was thinking of this idea that we're tempor life is temporary. And when life is temporary, hello, when life is temporary, you don't waste it. So this is a big park. It's, um, uh, which one is it? The Franklin Canyon? Which, Chaz, which is the one that we went to? Uh, I think it's Franklin Canyon. No, 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 no. Oh. It's, it's nearby. The Viking? What? Oh. what? What was it? No, 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 not Franklin. No, it's not Franklin. It's the one here. Baldwin Hills. So after Baldwin Hills, oh. which one is that? Whatever. Something, whatever. Next to Baldwin Hills. It's a park that there's hundreds of people there. There's no way. Yeah, the park. There's no way that you're going to find it. It's this small little tiny thing. Only one of them. No way. Just, I was just talking about a rabbi with the same name as you. So, so um, what was I saying? So I said, okay, listen, it's our anniversary, but let me just quickly go. And we'll stop at this place. And we'll, uh, I, I, I'm just going to look. I'm not going to give up. It's a waste. I need to go and buy another one, even though... Okay, hey, whatever, it's, a, it's money, but thank God I can buy another one. But at the same time, I said, I don't want to waste it. It's one, I know, I know where I parked, let me go and look for it. And I only said that because of the idea that life is temporary, because I had in my mind that life is temporary. We went to the spot that I parked, I looked on the floor and I found it. Wow. Wow. To me, that's, that's crazy. crazy. Now, someone could say, oh, okay. Look, look how small this is. This is, this is it. And it was like, this is it. I, I went, looked around. I said, I'm not going to give up. I went all the way. And we found it. It was. It was. That's a great way. 
But the, the crazy thing is, I was debating in my mind the whole morning before we even, to even mention it. Ah, we're not going to find it. It's, it's going to go there. It's for sure not going to find it. Forget it. Should I go? But I should go. Life is temporary. I was listening to another rabbi speaking about this. Life is temporary. I should go. But no, nah, whatever. I can't waste. We'll go. And I found it. And to me, that's the lesson of Judaism. Judaism tells you that when you're real with life, that life is temporary, you also say you don't waste things. It's like going into someone's house. And you're a visitor there. You take a napkin, so you take one, take two. Take five. You take five, you start taking the whole pack. You start putting a whole pack. What do you think the guest is going to, I mean, in our house, it's still weird, but whatever, it might be a, it might be a little different, you know, because we see stuff. But in a normal house where there's, you know, a few, the family and the kids, and there's one, one or two guests, right? Not, a million people. But one or two guests sitting down also, so you got to behave. You know, it's not your house. And you, you wouldn't start putting tissues in your, this pocket, you know, loading your pocket with tissue. It's, eventually, the owner's going to be like, he wouldn't say anything because, you know, it's tissues after all. But hello, what are you doing? This is not your house. So that's really how we approach the world. <laughs> when I recognize that this world is not my house, it's just temporary. I'm only here as a visitor. We also treat it in a different way. I don't own this. I've got to give it a certain sense of respect because it's not mine. So this is the idea of uh, Rabbi Akiva. Listen to what he says, and we'll tie it in to uh, the idea of what we spoke about. So he said like this, Rabbi Akiva used to say, the idea that we are in this world in terms of being here temporarily, and we've got to make the most out of the time that we're here. And the person that does, he's going to laugh at his last day. That's the message. Okay, so he says like this, Hakon natun be'eravon. Treat life where everything has been given to you as a pledge. As something that's a deposit. It's not yours. Nothing's yours. Even your hands, you have a right to to it, may you think. That's true, but it's still not yours. You've been, given, you've been given it as a gift and you have a temporary amount of time to use it. Use it right. You have eyes, use them right. You have a body, use it right. It's all temporary. That's the language of, of Hakol Natun Be'eravon. Everything is a deposit. By the way, as a parent, looking at your kids in that way is also very healthy. My kids are not something I own but they're a gift that have been deposited in my hands and I have to look after them well. You treat your child a different way when you look at it like this. Nothing is mine really. It's mine to use, but I have to respect it because it's not mine. Hakol be'eravon. That's the third, first thing he says. Umetsuda prosal kol There's a net on the entire feeling of life, like a trap on life. Meaning, no one knows you can know a lot of things, but you can't know when life is going to end. And also, we're all under this one net, which is God. Like it says in Tehillim, listen to this statement in Psalms. We are all under Hashem. We're all under this net. How does that change my life when I think this way? Listen to the saying in Psalms. It's Psalms 139. This is what he says. This is David, David HaMelech, who only lived for 70 years. And he said like this. Where can I run away from your, where can I go from your energy, from the energy of God? You can't. As long as you exist, there's no way. How can I run away from you? I can't. If I try to be an astronaut, go in the heavens, you're still there, you still exist. As long as my heart's beating, you're existing. If I try to go into the depths of earth, you'll still be there. There's a lot of depth behind here. But he says that I would lift in the morning. I will go up with dawn and I will go down with, when it starts becoming sundown. I will go down with the sundown. Meaning when things are good for me, I will look at you. And in that moment, also there, when I think I don't need you because things are already going good for me, your hand guides me and you hold me all along. I see 
your blessings when things are going good for me. And then he says, Va'umar, maybe I'll say to myself, maybe in darkness I will be concealed. Uh, when I'm in a dark place, no one sees me. It's like the people that go into a bar, they love it, it's dark, they can do whatever they want. Hey, don't, don't think that way. I, darkness will conceal me. Night will protect me. Gam choshech leachshich mi Mecca. Know that darkness cannot run away from God. He sees everything. Velayla kayom. Night is like, like day for God. Ya'il, it's light for him, like dark. It doesn't make a difference. Kachashicha ka'ora. Darkness is like light. It's like somebody who went into our garage door on the video. We've got a video. And he just came out of his car at 12 o'clock at night. Spray painting our, our wall. Graffiti, go, go and look, it's very interesting. But it's not, it's not, it's not anything anti-Semitic, we were concerned, but thank you, Max. Uh, it's not anything uh, anti-Semitic, so we're, we're good. But if it was, then I'll be worried, because then I know it's targeting us specifically. But it was just some graffiti. But you see the guy coming at night in his car, getting out his car, looks like a pretty nice car, and just spray painting on our, hello. Yeah. Now, the camera, <coughs> this was at night, it's dark. It's dark there. But nowadays we have cameras that even in the darkest of places, with infrared, you can have somebody on the other side of the world and they are watching every action of yours. So today, with technology, we can understand... One second. Oops. This thing. Okay. So today, with technology, we can understand the concept of even if I'm in the dark, thinking that I can get away with whatever I want, there's nowhere to hide, People can see me, but that idea of people seeing you is a new idea in the physical world. And it's a reminder that it's possible that your actions are recorded and God sees you also. Okay, so he says that wherever I go, you're with me. You made all my innards, all my parts, all everything of me to sukeni bebeteni me. You carried me. In the womb of my mother, which is when I was so vulnerable. I spoke once to a biologist. He told me, if you take a pen, you make a dot on the pen. When you were first created, that zygote was smaller than that dot that you make with a pen. Just think about that for a second. That's how fragile you were. And yet you're here. So there's a lot that happens in the womb of your mother. But God was there with me all along. I will thank you for all the wonders you've done. Your actions are beautiful and wondrous. My soul deeply knows it. That I am a living miracle. Deep down, my body, my soul knows it. <laughs> so, uh, so this is what he says. So that's his saying that when you think about life, there is a net on top of us all. And what does that mean? That we're all under the same uh, space, under the... Protection of Hashem, that's the idea. So he says, he continues and he says, Hachanut Ptucha, the store is open. This is an example of how you should look at life. There's a store that we're all in. And the store is open. It's like uh, the Amazon Fresh. No one's watching, you're wondering, hey, wait a second. No, no one knows what's going on, I take. But then it's a bit different than Amazon Fresh because when you walk out, they say that you took a whole bunch of stuff that you didn't. They still, there's still a glitch in the system. You know, when you take something that you like, especially with, if you're with kids, forget it. Uh, the computer system f doesn't know what the heck is going on. I'm walking with my kids. They put something in. I'm saying, no, we're not taking that. They take a doll. Can we have that? No, it's not. They, all of us, but we get charged for it because the machines, the cameras are seeing stuff going back and forth. We got charged for two watermelons. We didn't take one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's the, the uh, cameras are, are learning slowly. Don't worry, they'll, they'll get it at some point. But anyway, what was that? What was that? Uh, yeah. Okay, let's not blame Shira, but also what about the flowers? We went to the flower area. Should we get the roses? No, we took it. Nah, forget it. This one, that one. So, you see, we're all corporates. 
Uh, and then I went, and then I went to the electronic section. And that was it. For me, going to stores as a guy, I'm like, Shira, I'll see you later. I got to check out these new drones that came out, and all the electronics. For me, that's that's where I belong. All the adult toys, uh, which are the good ones. Okay, so uh, this is what he says. He says that the store is open. But Chenveni Mekif and the storekeeper says, you don't have to pay right away. You can pay, you can pay on credit. Take, take whatever you need. That's life. Do whatever you want. You've got free will. But you might not see it, but there is a register that's opened, that's counting everything that we take, and it doesn't make mistakes. Vayat Kotevet, it writes down, records everything that's done. And if you want to borrow, you can borrow. But know that every single day, there are messengers that will come. They will come to you to try and take something back every day. Who are these messengers? The challenges of life. It says, The challenges of life clean us. So although we have free choice and we do whatever we want, if we make mistakes... The messengers, which are the challenges and the, the negative energies that you go through, they are there to purify me, to, um, to make me better. And it says in the Nefesh HaChaim, Reb Chaim Mivelajan, a great tzaddik, a great philosopher and writer, says that we know, en tzaddik There's no such thing as a righteous person that's perfect in this world. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone. So as long as we're human, we're making mistakes. And there are negative energies to try and make sure that we're not making mistakes. Uh, even, let's say, when I put my hand in my pocket, according to Judaism, I take out the wrong key. That's a challenge and it's there to make me realize something. It's there to make me grow. Every single challenge that comes, I take out the wrong coin, I was meant to take out this coin, took out the wrong one. That's a challenge. It's there to purify me a little bit. Maybe it's there to remind me that I have money in my pocket. Maybe it's to remind me that I have a house. There are many reasons why I take out the wrong key. But they're there to purify me a little bit. And there are two ways. This is what Mulchaim Bivilajan says. There's two ways to fix that. Either you give the money, you, you, whatever you took wrong, you, take it, you give it back. Which meaning you say, I didn't, I didn't mean it. I don't want to do it, and I accept, I speak it out, I say that I didn't want to do it. This is Teshuvah. But I say, I didn't want to do it, I didn't mean it. I speak it out, I don't need to go to some person. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person that's connected to God, you don't need to go to no rabbi. You speak it out between you and yourself, just don't let anyone see you, so they might think you're a little crazy. But you speak it out and say, I really didn't want to do that. That was a mistake, and that's already a way to fix a lot of what you did wrong. But even if not, even if somebody leaves this world and was, did terrible things their entire life, stealing everything you can imagine that's wrong their entire life, they leave this world, even then, you still have a chance to come back in this world. There's something called reincarnation, according to Judaism. There's always a chance to fix. And he talks about this. Listen to this. The messengers of God are coming after you every day to try and take back any of the mistakes you've done. By the way, in our lifetime, if we fix our own problems, just in general. Recently, I went to the dentist. I hate it, but I have to go. I, I know, I know, I know. I try not to smile too much. So, so I went to British teeth. So I went to the dentist and... Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he tells me off, of course. It's payback time for him. He tells me off. You've got to do more. Dental floss. Da, da, da. Right? He gives me the whole spiel. And then he starts cleaning my teeth. Oh, it's painful. And I, say to him, I said to him, you know what this reminds me of? This is Judaism. Why? In Judaism, if you clean yourself, it's a lot easier than if somebody else has to clean you. You know, if you have a... If you have, a, I don't know, the mashal, the parable that's given in, in the many of the Sifrei Musa, the books of ethics, is if you have a chicken and the chicken gets dirty, so how does he clean himself? Or a dog, let's say, nowadays, 
When you have a duck, how does he clean himself? He shakes himself up, gets in the water, shakes himself up, and that's it. But if you need to clean the duck because he's not able to, oh, it hurts. You have to pull, you have to clean and comb, and then it starts hurting the duck. It's much easier when the animal cleans themselves first. So it's the same with us. If I'm looking after my teeth all the time, I'm talking to myself, then it'll be a lot easier. Then you don't have to go through the pain of the dentist. It's a lot easier when you take care of yourself. So the same with uh, Judaism. When we take care of the mistakes that we've done, it's a lot easier than if we have to be fixed through these messengers, whether they are challenges that come our way that we don't know why they're coming. A lot of times they're there to purify me and perfect me. They're there, all oh, everything's for the good. That's, that's something we believe, that everything always is for the good, but they're there to perfect me. So he says that they're coming every day to challenge you. And they come to you with your consent or without your consent. Whether you ask for it or not, they're gonna, the challenge comes. You didn't ask for it. Oh, it didn't work out. Why? We didn't ask you. The messengers came and they have a right to come. The Yeshlem, don't complain. Yeshlem and Masha Yismochu, they have a right to come. Do you know why? Because God's sending them. There's truth here. The fact is, mistakes were made. And truth is that they need to do it to perfect you. We don't want this to continue, and therefore it needs to happen to perfect you. And everything. No, this is the final statement. Know that everything that happens to you in life is metukan la sauda is ready for your big banquet meal at the end. What's the banquet meal? When you leave this world, you will have a great feast that's waiting for you. No matter who you are, there is a feast. There's a party that's waiting for you. And we said that the righteous, they will laugh on the last day. So the aim is to come through this world and make sure we're not perfect. And There's no such a thing as a righteous person that can live in this world and not do wrong. No one's perfect. But to try our best to make the most out of the time in this world as visitors. And I tell you this, when you treat life that you're visiting it, you'll take life a little more seriously and you'll bring blessings into your life. It seems the opposite. Run away from the reality of us being here temporarily. Don't think about next year, 10 years from now. But what do we say? The opposite. Live life knowing that it's temporary. You'll make the most, you won't date the wrong people. You won't date people that are wasting your time. You, you look for stages in your life that move you forward in the right way without waiting because we're all temporary. And we know that. So you're actually pushed into the right directions. Or there's many other examples. There's many things that you will see in your life when you look at it in this, in this angle that things will be respected more and loved more and you will feel a little more uh, meaning in your life because you treat it temporary. It's very interesting in Judaism, a lot of things we say, do the opposite of what you would think. Treat life as temporary, and then it'll, by doing that, it becomes more permanent. Yeah. It, it becomes real. The opposite, what you, people will say, no, don't do that. Treat life like as it's forever. But it's exactly the opposite. There's many, many ways in life that we do that in Judaism. Um, but... Uh, I think that that's it for now. We've had a, enough with everything, but it's been fun. And uh, thank you for coming and joining. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Looking forward to next week. Thank you. Yeah.